Ukraine was hit by an all-out assault on its country by Russia overnight. Preceding those attacks were cyber attacks, some of which caused government sites to go offline. I'm joined by two experts in cybersecurity. Molly McDougall is a director of threat intelligence at COFENCE. She served with the House Foreign Affairs Committee in 2014 during Crimea and was a cyber threat analyst with the Department of Homeland Security during the Notpetya attack that targeted Ukraine and other European countries. And Peter Prezio is CEO of SnapAttack. He has 15 years of experience in cybersecurity with insight on tech solutions for solving cybersecurity risk, as well as leadership in the industry. He focuses on simplifying complex cybersecurity products. Welcome to the show to both of you. And Peter, can you tell me a little bit about what we have been seeing in terms of cyber attacks leading up to the physical assault? Yeah, absolutely, Daniel. So, you know, what we saw starting last week, really, um, it was a series of DDoS, denial of service attacks, uh, focused really on uh, government, government sites and banks within the Ukraine. And most of that was really around, um, you know, trying to build a bit of social unrest inside of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, people. The attacks have since kind of progressed into, um, there's been much more of a destructive attack uh, based on a piece of malware um, that's been dubbed hermetic wiper. So it's a wiper. It's not around um, taking control of a system or anything like that. It's, its entire goal is to wipe the data from a system in an unrecoverable way. So it's a, a really destructive attack. So if we're seeing the Ministry of Defense website go down, it's not just the face of the website. There's a lot of data potentially being lost behind it. You understand um, that? De depending on um, it, depending on if that was part of the DDoS attack, if it was part of the DDoS, um, that could just be a denial of service taking the system down. Um, what we've really been seeing for the Hermetic Wiper has been focused more on uh, the the enterprises and also critical infrastructure inside of the Ukraine. For the extensiveness of the Wiper activity that we are aware of at this point, that's publicly available in the press, um, is more limited than for example, not Petya. Um, and one thing that I would note too, is I think a lot of us in the cybersecurity community, as we saw Russia preparing for a potential evasion, invasion, um, I think we were prepared for much more high level attack and more widespread attacks within Ukraine. I would note that DDoS attacks and website defacements, it's fairly low level compared to Russia's capability set. Um, and I do think some wonder if this was uh, verifiably or certainly Russian activity. Um, I think there's also the possibility that these more minor distractions could have been conducted by uh, sympathizers or criminal organizations with ties to the Kremlin as well. So that's something to consider. And of course, it'll take a long time to follow the thread on these attacks and know if we will ever know. Um, but that is something that's interesting. And from what I saw, a lot of the organizations that faced DDoS attacks were fairly quickly able to recover and get back online. Though the wiper malware seems far more um, destructive and painful to those targeted. And Molly, very targeted. And Molly, you, you've been around this area for a lot in the, in the cyberspace area in Ukraine. What are Ukraine's capabilities like defensively compared to Russia's offensive cyber capabilities? That's a great question. Um, probably a question that we'll get more insights into in the coming days and weeks. Uh, I will say Russia is considered very much a top tiered, highly sophisticated nation state actor. Um, I, I don't think Ukraine is considered as, as such. Um, we have seen Ukrainians reach out to um, NATO members for collaboration and support in cyber defense, uh, which to me indicates uh, a major asymmetry in capabilities here. And not just talking about asymmetries, I think they may have just gotten started a little bit. We have an article on our sister publication, C4ISRnet, where Greg Austin, a senior fellow for cyberspace and future conflicts at the Institute for Strategic Studies, said that Russia has launched many cyber, tracks on, cyber, cyber attacks on Ukraine. But it's interesting what he added, saying that even as the Ukraine crisis escalates further, 
Russia is unlikely to unleash the full power of cyber sabotage operations. Uh, Peter, do you know how much is, is left in store here? Um, you know, it's really hard to say how much is left in store, but I think it does point to the fact that they are a top tier nation state actor. And, um, you know, as such with cyber, as soon as you use something that might be a novel attack, it now becomes publicly known and in the public space and people can start to prepare defenses around it. So uh, it's likely in Russia's best interest that they they hold some of those back if they want to maintain uh, that, that capability um, and the threat of capability and the threat of attack uh, as, a, as a prominent weapon. Molly? I completely agree. I think we've seen a fraction of what Russia is capable of. And exactly to Peter's point, the second that a nation state reveals the tools in its tool chest, um, especially those that are zero days and unknown, um, they, they allow their potential adversaries to get a head start in countering those weapons. So I think it is quite unlikely that um, should this conflict remain contained to Ukraine, that we would see the full extent of Russian capability. And some sort of expansion, some more interaction with other with other countries, rather, uh, the president just alluded to, President Biden just wrapped up his speech. Let's take a look at that clip. America stands up to bullies. We stand up for freedom. This is who we are. Let me also repeat the warning I made last week. If Russia pursues cyber attacks against our companies, our critical infrastructure, we are prepared to respond. For months, we've been working closely with, our pri with the private sector to harden our cyber defenses, sharpen our ability to respond to Russian cyber attacks as well. Molly, as we just heard the president say that he's essentially sharpening the knife to prepare for cyber attacks and defending on, on the cyber front, what, what goes into that? Um, a great deal goes into that, both defensively and offensively. Uh, my read here is that uh, Biden is signaling to Putin that we are ready to defend our critical infrastructure and also inflict major consequences should our critical infrastructure be meddled with. Um, and so this is a lot of signaling while also creating a great deal of space for exit ramping, if you will. I think both uh, Russia and the United States are preparing for a ratcheting up or ratcheting back, depending on how this tit for tat goes. Um, we are dealing with the fog of war. I'm sure it's a, a phrase that everybody who's been tuned in over the last 72 hours, especially has heard repeatedly, where we don't know exactly what Putin is thinking. And similarly, we don't want Putin to know exactly what we're thinking, but we want that him to have an understanding of what our red lines are. To me, this is Biden saying, this is what we will not tolerate. And it will be very, very painful for you if you try to go here. And by go here, I mean conduct disruptive or destructive attacks against U.S. critical infrastructure. And he mentioned the private sector by name. Peter, you've been working in the private sector for quite a while. What, what's Russia's, how have people been looking at Russia the past few years? So, I mean, where we focus is heavily on uh, on the defense side with Russia in the private sector. So um, everybody's been really trying to dig into what are those actual techniques and procedures that um, have been associated with the Russian threat actor and uh, their associated groups of folks like Sandworm, right? And Fancy Bear and, and the likes and really trying to dial in how do we map what their behaviors are and build those into our defense? So, uh, you know, along with this particular um, conflict that we have in front of us, there's been a flurry of activity around, you know, how, how are we validating what our defenses are against these kinds of attacks that Ukraine is experiencing? And then how, you know, if we are exposed, how can we rapidly implement some sort of a um, compensated control or a defense uh, mechanism or an alerting or detection, which is really um, something that gives you a, a, a look into whether or not this activity is, is coming down on you.
I think private sector information sec sharing and private public sector information sharing plays a huge role in this. And I'm hearing a lot of really encouraging news from peers um, in the financial sector and energy sector here around um, close collaboration across different organizations, leadership, and with both Treasury and uh, DHS. So I, I, I am encouraged to hear that there is a lot of uh, collaboration and information sharing set up um, as well. And I, I do think that that is as critical now as it's ever been for, for us here. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I, you know, specifically, you know, hitting the DHS CISA alerts around Russia and focusing in on the information that's available. And then really just trying to stay on top of the news and figuring out what is new, what's emerging and, and how impactful an attack against me as a corporation could be. And as you saw last, last year with the, 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 the gas attack with, with that ransomware that, you know, br brought our, our gas supply down. Not it's not just critical infrastructure, it's, it's other important infrastructure. So if you have something let's say some sort of pipeline or a power plant, should you be worried? Should, should you be getting on the phone? I would say you should be on high alert at this stage. If you are in energy, telecoms, financial services, essentially anything within our, um, excuse me, critical infrastructure, which I think does definitely include our energy supply lines and pipelines, I would say this is a time for high alert. One thing that is a challenge is that uh, playbooks evolve and and we learn them as they unfold. and and we are all globally watching closely what Putin does um, in Ukraine. We're in a space that's still evolving when it comes to cyber warfare. Red lines are not well uh, decided upon. There's no real collective agreement internationally on what's the no-go zone. And I think what we've observed is that past activity, past actions by nation state actors are not necessarily the best indicators of what's coming in this space. A good example is actually, let's look at Iran. Um, as the US was pulling out of the Iranian nuclear agreement, there were so many assessments that the financial sector was sure to be in the crosshairs of Iranian retaliatory cyber activity um, because that was how Iran had uh, retaliated against initial sanctions in 2013. And then again, when Soleimani was assassinated, there were tons of warnings. OK, this is the time that Iran is now going to target our financial services sector. And still, that didn't happen. And there was a lot of confidence a lot across a lot of organizations in the space that it would. And it really went to show that these playbooks are evolving, and it's not as predictable. And that's unfortunate, unpredictability um, it's a really difficult terrain to be in when you're in a conflict, and uh, but it's something to bear in mind and a reason why we need to be on high alert and prepared for any way that this can go. Um, and I think, too, that is why we're seeing, I, I think that's why we saw the uh, EU, all the NATO countries with the sanctions that were announced today, I don't think that they went as full bore as they could have with what is available to them to use to punish Russia. Um, it could be to leave some rope for de-escalation here and to not further escalate what's going on. And we, we talked earlier about, uh, well, you talked about nation states and we've talked about smaller actors, maybe a cyber version of a militia. What, what can we see? What's the difference between them, essentially? Oftentimes it comes down more to resources and um, and the, the backing that they have behind them. Um, what is interesting about where we are right now is oftentimes those smaller threat actors and those militia type groups um, choose moments like right now as opportunistic moments to conduct attacks elsewhere um, or piggyback to uh, focus on some sort of agenda that they have. Um, so, you know, obviously right now we're seeing a very big disruption activity coming out of Russia, but maybe there's a financially motivated cyber criminal that wants to take advantage while everyone's focused, you know, in that, in one direction, they can come at it from a different direction. 
There are also some possible loose links between some cyber criminal organizations and nation states um, and nation state groups. And it's quite possible too that some of these lower level criminal groups are operating on a handshake with the governments that then have plausible deniability of, well, that wasn't us actually. Um, and so that is another um, aspect to this that adds more confusion and muddles the terrain, I would say, when it comes to really deciphering who's behind what activity. As I say, I think that's also, you know, really indicative of the difference between cyber warfare and physical warfare. It's really challenging to determine exactly, at least uh, in, a, in a, the most timely way, exactly who's behind a cyber attack versus, you know, if somebody pushes the launch button on a missile or something, like it's pretty apparent who did that. Um, so really digging into who's behind the attacks when they're happening is, it is a, a bit of a problem and a bit of a challenge. Um, outcome might not be any different if you know or don't know, but uh, you know, you'll be affected nonetheless. And now I was actually getting a little curious there. If you look at, at, at an attack, how do you know who it was more or less? <laughs> that's a, that, it's kind of an age old question in the security industry is that the attribution problem, um, you know, one gen, one opinion that I have is we do tend to over rotate a little bit on on the attribution piece. It's really nice to know who's behind uh, these attacks, and if they're widespread, a nation state attack. Like, obviously, they're attributing that attack back to that nation state makes a lot of sense because then you can impose some more uh, global economic type sanctions and things like that um, as an enterprise it might not matter quite so much um, who's really behind it as long as it's uh, something that you are prepared for. Yeah, and it can take, while attribution might be possible, it will take a very long time to verify. And so in terms of reaction, now our current, because of how globalized and how interconnected we are, the pace of relationship building, conflict making, peacemaking, it evolves so fast um, and often outpaces the amount of time required for an investigation into a cyber attack. So in the long game, it can play a big role, but in the short game, it uh, is much more complicated. If the cyber threats persist and, and Russia gets more active and the defensive side gets more active, are we gonna see a lot of innovation in cybersecurity? What you will see, obviously, are the the immediate effects of um, identifying what the indicators of compromise are and sharing that data around the, the attack and trying to you know, implement those in your perimeter defensive systems. But, um, and I think this is maybe a trend that's already occurring and, and will just expedite, is really moving into a more proactive security posture overall, right? So we're really going to be focusing in on looking for how those threat actors perform these attacks, what they're, you know, oftentimes some folks call them indicators of attack or indicators of behavior, but really what are those patterns of attacks that we can look for, that we can detect on, that we can uh, successfully block quarantine and isolate, um, in a, and implement those in our defenses in a proactive way, rather than waiting for um, the data exchange of the indicators of compromise. So um, I think you'll see a, a trend to moving in the proactive direction and, um, and really focusing in on not only implementing those, but implementing ways to test and validate that you have those capabilities in your arsenal and they're functioning as expected, right? Because that's uh, another big problem is people deploy things out into their networks um, without means of testing or validating that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. I completely agree. And Peter, you took the words out of my mouth um, in terms of the need for proactive defense. The company I'm working with right now, we are completely focused on phishing threats. 
and we're getting customer questions around what do we need to be looking for um, as this conflict has heated up. Unfortunately, any access intended that, that Russia intends to use uh, for conducting cyber attacks have probably long been in place. The phishing likely happened months ago, possibly even longer. So we can't organize our cyber react defense measures around events. Uh, we have to be consistently prepared and proactive in our defensive measures. And I think that this event is really driving that home. And I really hope that this will encourage organizations to take a more consistent, vigilant approach and not such a reactive approach to events as they are unfolding. Because at that point, you're really hamstrung in terms of what you can do. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could be here all day, but there's a lot going on and we've all got to got to get back at it. Molly and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.